Yes. Kami ada di. Thirty seconds, please. We are live. Okay. A very good evening, everyone. On behalf of ICMR National Institute for Research in Productive Health, it is my immense pleasure to welcome you all for commemorating the event of the 90th birthday of Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee, the Indian architect of IVF, a Katastu baby. It is a matter of pride for me to compare the to com to compare the celebrations of Dr. Mukherjee, a role model for me. Each time I read about him, I know about him. I get awestruck. I am inspired by the vision of this great man, the man now credited for the birth of first test tube baby in India, a scientist by passion and a true re clinical researcher, whose work has given hopes to so many childless couples for who are desiring parenthood. On his birthday, we wonder, "Kon aalo ke praneer pradeep jaliye to me dorai asho." While you come down to earth, from which source do you light up your lamp, Dr. Mukherjee? E prati bir aaje lokho lokho praneer pradeep er alor utsu apni. Dr. Mukherjee, you are the source of light for many lamps on this earth. It is the birthday of this great man, and we must all celebrate. And so let the celebrations begin. I invite our director in charge, Dr. Manisha Matkaykar. And the director of ICMR NIRRH to welcome everyone and tell us about the genesis of this event. Dr. Manisha, please. Good evening, everybody. Dr. Mahale, madam, uh, director of NIRRH, who has just recently retired. All the invited uh, speakers for today, Dr. Sandar Sadande, uh, Mrs. Anupriya Agarwal, uh, Dr. Rajvi Mehta. Dr. Duru Shah, Dr. Shrabani Mukherjee, I think who is also an uh, important part of organizing this event, Dr. Deepak, all the colleagues of NIRRH and all those who are participating in this event. A warm welcome uh, on behalf of NIRRH to all of you on this uh, symposium on uh, uh, being organized in the memory of Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee. As Deepak has already said, Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee is one of the most brilliant re reproductive biologists and made a pioneering contribution in the field of IVF. And I am, uh, I think all of us are very proud of him. And uh, I am really looking forward to all the speakers and listening to the story of uh, Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee uh, uh, in next uh, couple of hours. So. I think events like this, where we look at the stories of uh, different uh, legends in different areas, are extremely important, especially from the for the young researchers and the young scientists in this field. These stories actually uh, teach us teach us a lot. It tells you that you don't really require fancy techniques, a uh, lot of money, uh, to make a mark in this field. What you really need is to think out of the box. Think out of the box and then pursue a desire to pursue your uh, dreams with passion and dedication. And uh, the story of Shubhash Mukherjee also tells us the same. And what is also important uh, uh, to learn from his story is that uh, it is not always that one gets rec recognition at the time it is required. But I think eventually a good work will always get the recognition that is due. And I think uh, the, uh, the recognition for Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee, though it has come late, I think all of us uh, will agree that uh, all, uh, uh, entire India or those especially working in this field uh, really feel proud of this contribution of this great man. So, I, uh, Dr. Shrabani has given me a task of giving just a background of uh, the work that NIRRH has been doing, in the, especially in the field of IVF. So, as uh, Dr. Deepak has said, uh, you know, ours is an ICMR institute, uh, 
uh, now we recently celebrated our golden jubilee so it is 50 years old institute now and it has been doing a pioneering work in the basic research as well as implementation research in the field of reproductive biology i am relatively new to this institute because i've just joined few days back and my field is completely different so if I make some mistakes while giving you the background about this institute, though Shrabadi has briefed me adequately, uh, so please uh, uh, consider that. So NIRH has been closely involved in the development and evolution of the assisted reproductive technology. Actually, NIRH launched the first, probably India's first uh, uh, program in in vitro fertilization way back in 1980s under the leadership of uh, Dr. T.C. Anand Kumar, the, uh, uh, then the director of uh, Institute of uh, uh, IRR or what it was called before, Research and Reproduction. And Dr. G.B. Parulekar, the dean of KM Hospital at that time. I think these two great visionaries started this program and uh, all uh, different departments of NIRRH collaborated and there was a strong clinical support from Dr. Indira Hinduja, which actually led to the success of this uh, program uh, at this institute. And the first test tube baby, uh, which was uh, recorded or uh, first documented test, test tube baby, was born in 1986. I think eventually NRRH and this program has helped in uh, a large number of patients uh, with infertility problems. And they currently also run a clinic. Human in vitro fertilization, which were then published by ICMR. Today, many st senior stalwarts in the field of ART in India. Uh, uh, did have some connection with this institute or the IVF team members of the uh, uh, members of this team. So many years later, actually, Dr. Anand Kumar, I think, when he visited the institute uh, at Kolkata, uh, he went through the handwritten notes and the diaries of Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee. Uh, then he realized that. Uh, the great contribution of this man. He was convinced that the first test tube, uh, this is the person who should get the credit for first test tube baby. And I wrote, uh, wrote a paper in the uh, uh, current science journal uh, acknowledging his contribution. I think uh, as the credit came from the ex director of uh, IRR and the one, especially from the one who was himself was credited with the first test tube baby. I think the entire uh, scientific community acknowledged the great contribution uh, by Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee. Actually, Dr. Smita Mahale was the one who last year under the leadership uh, 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 during the celebrations of uh, Golden Jubilee of NIRRH initiated a project with the help of Indian National Science Academy uh, to archive the work of Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee which uh, I think Dr. Shabani Mukherjee and uh, Dr. Mehta are working on it. But a small booklet on the Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee was released by uh, our health minister, Dr. Harsh Vardhan, on the occasion of the Golden Jubilee celebrations. So today, ICMR NIRRH continues to work in the domain of reproductive health and has have made uh, significant contributions in this field, especially in the uh, difficult situation of COVID-19 currently. So uh, I must say that uh, uh, this is the right time that uh, we are celebrating and uh, remembering the contribution of Dr. Subhash Mukherjee today on his 90th birth, birth anniversary. And I am really looking forward to listening to the, all the speakers who were directly or indirectly associated with the work of Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee. And with this, I think I'll stop here and I'll uh, request Deepak to continue with the uh, proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam. Uh, to commemorate the findings of this great man and take it to the masses, my colleagues, Dr. Shabani Mukherjee, 
and Dr. Rajvi Mehta got together on a project sponsored by the Indian National Academy of Sciences, INSA. The project is entitled Archiving the Work of Dr. Mukherjee, the Architect of, the Architect of India's First Test Tube Baby. They also wrote the book, Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee, a visionary and pioneer in IVF. No other day than today could be a better day to launch this book. I invite Dr. Smita Mahale, who is the brainchild behind this project, and also the recipient of Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee Oration Awards from ICMR and Academy of Clinical Embryologists to launch this book and dedicate it to the nation. Dr. Mahale, please. Thank you, Deepak. I also join Dr. Manisha in welcoming all of you for this event. It's a great pleasure to be part of uh, today's symposium to pay our tribute to Dr. Subhash Mukherjee on his 90th birthday. We know that science, arts, and history are most important aspects of civilization, whether it is an ancient civilization or modern civilization. And when we look at our history, there are some inspiring people who have played a major role in bringing or nurturing science in this country. I would pay my respect and tribute to Dr. Mr. Vivekananda Swamiji. From Ramakrishna Mission, they had taken several activities to promote science and history of science. And I read somewhere that he was the person who inspired Jamshedji Tata start the Indian Institute of Sciences in Bangalore. The story goes back, they were traveling once to US. And most of us know Vivekananda ji went to US and uh, his uh, famous speech there. So during the journey, Vivekananda asked Jamshed ji Tata, why are you going to USA? He said, bring the steel business to India. He said, if you're bringing the steel business, you must bring material sciences to India. And that's how the seeds for Indian Institute of Science were sown. And during the last 100 or 110 years, there were so many developments in India. And after independence, we can count more on them. So Indian Science Congress, all of us are aware. So somewhere in 2000, 1940 when uh, centenary celebrations were going on, the then PM announced that all the science academies, all the scientific organizations should work towards preserving our history, the way we prevent our um, cultures and other things, art. So that's how the societies, the academies, they started working towards the history of science in India. And the National Science, National Academy of Sciences in Allahabad, along with Ramakrishna Mission, came out with series of books. Almost there are seven volumes. Anybody can uh, visit the site, right from medicine, engineering, plant sciences, animal sciences, biochemistry. It's worth reading. And there are some important events, important scientists who have been uh, named there. But it doesn't care of each and every individual. There are several unsung heroes in the country. And one such hero is Dr. Subhash Mukherjee. The Indian National Science Academy also initiated several acts by funding programs. So they invited applications from researchers to initiate projects where the, we will understand something about our history and we will disseminate that knowledge to the next generation. That's how in uh, 2019, when there was a call from INSA for proposals, Dr. Shabani and Dr. Rajvi, they took initiative and they wrote a project. And the exercise we are now doing is part of INSA-supported activity. So during this time, I had an opportunity to interact and meet Dr. Sunit Mukherjee. For us, if at all we know Subhash Mukherjee, it is because of two individuals. As it was mentioned earlier, our 
our director, Dr. T.C. Anand Kumar, and Dr. Sunit Mukherjee, who helped us more to understand Subhash Mukherjee in, in scientific manner. So I did visit him in his uh, lab. He, though he's a food technologist, he was running his lab and he was also preserving all the material, the scientific documents of Subhash Mukherjee. And he expressed his wish that some institute should take care of all these material and uh, have some kind of uh, archival. And that is the time me and uh, my colleague Shabani and the uh, old friend of ours and uh, our former student Rajvi, we prepared a plan and did go through its wealth of information. It's, I would say it's a, like a treasury, which was made available for us. And all the material was archived. And that's how this small booklet was done. And eventually, something else will come up, maybe for next year when we meet uh, during this uh, 91st birthday, maybe. Uh, we look forward for that. And as it was mentioned earlier, this booklet gives glimpses of his uh, journey, his achievements. And it was released uh, last year in February, and we thought we will make it uh, more user friendly by having an electronic version and it will be freely available on our website for anybody. So we knew the next generation, we would like them to know about our history and the entire exercise is being done for that. ICMR, our parent organization also after the exercise of Anand Kumar did realize the importance and the work that was done by Subhash Mukherjee. They instituted an award in his memory, which is called as ICMR, Dr. Subhash Mukherjee Memorial Oration Award. At the same time, Academy of Clinical Embryologists of India, they have also initiated an award in memory of uh, Subhash Mukherjee. So with this few words, I thank uh, the organizers. Though I'm a, I was a part of it, I thank all of you for, uh, especially Rajvi and Shabani for uh, taking this initiative and uh, inviting the uh, live uh, birth uh, person here, uh, Ms. Kanupriya. Welcome you for this uh, event. And it's so nice to see everybody, Dr. Durusha, we would like to listen more from you about uh, what has changed and how it is being done uh, in uh, our country today. With this, I will uh, release the e-version of the book. So with this, I think I hand over to Deepak. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. It is, it is, a, it is a matter of honor, a matter of pride for all of us. Uh, as madam has said, this book is in English and it is available free on our institute website. Everyone is encouraged to read and widely circulate it so that the next generation and generations to come know about the history of this great man. Uh, as, Dr. as Dr. Manisha Matkaikar and Dr. Bhalek highlighted, the ICMR NIRRH was instrumental in the first scientifically documented IVF baby in India on 6th August 1986. 
our former director, Dr. T.C. Anand Kumar, and Dr. Indra Hinduja were the leaders. Dr. Rajvi Mehta was a part of this team and responsible for this feat at NIRRH. Rajvi, we are all very proud of you as our alumni. Uh, eventually, she helped Dr. Anand Kumar in going through the diaries of Dr. Mukherjee, and she's now involved with us in archiving all the information. It is my immense pleasure to invite her and tell us more about this book. Over to you, Rajvi, please. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, good evening, everybody. And today we celebrate the 90th birth anniversary of Dr. Subhash Mukherjee. And I must say that it is... Uh... One sec, I'll just wait for it. And I'll be talking about Dr. Subhash Mukherjee, the visionary in the field of assisted reproductive technologies. And the work that he has done is even stands today. So if we look at infertility, we know that millions of couples across the world suffer from infertility. And the figures in 2019 were 60 to 80 million, of which nearly 25% are thought to be in India. Now, when we look at it as a disease, Till the 1970s, there was a large group of people where, you know, infertility was not even considered as a disorder and people didn't even look, approach this problem as a medical problem or a pathological or a physiological problem. And things changed in 1978 when Louis Brown was born, which was a collaborative effort of the scientist, Dr. Professor Robert Edwards and the clinician, Dr. Uh, Patrick Steptoe. And this was a landmark in the treatment of infertility because now women who had blocked tubes who could have never ever conceived on their own and it was possible. And this was big news across the world. And around the same time, on October 3, 1978, 67 days later, there was a report in the newspapers about the birth of Durga, who we now know and is in front of us today as Kanupriya, who was born on this day. And since she was born during the Durga festival, her identity was anonymous and she was named as Durga, being a girl child. Now, there was a drastic difference between both these uh, uh, births, when it was Louis Brown or whether it was Durga. You, the announcements came in newspapers. Louis Brown's announcement came, the lovely Louis, and it was, you know, on the front page of many British and international newspapers. While the birth of Durga came in, birth of test tube baby claimed and it came in Amritha Bazar Patrika. And the word claim also raises doubts whether it was true or not, although there is a picture of her. But the question is whether it was a test tube baby. So this was a sad beginning, I would say, to the birth of IVF in India. And if we look at the responses that the first IVF baby had in UK and that they had in India was drastically different. The birth of Louis Brown the, was published or the birth or the conception of Louis Brown was published in Lancet, one of the topmost medical journals. Whilst here, Dr. Subhash Mukherjee, who had done this work uh, with Dr. Sumit and uh, his colleague, was not even allowed to present the work in medical journals and uh, in scientific conferences. Edwards was considered as the father of IVF, while here, Dr. Mukherjee's work was questioned and they said there was no evidence of proof. Dr. Subhash, uh, Dr. P Professor Edwards received the Laskar Foundation Award, one of the highest awards, and his work formed the base of the ART techniques. But when it came to Dr. Subhash, he was ostracized, humiliated, and stopped from doing research. So these were two events which were just 67 days apart, but the way they were treated in the first in Europe, in UK, sorry, and the one in India was drastically different. Further on, Professor Edwards went on to receive the Nobel Prize, which was received on his behalf by his wife. But what happened to the Mukherjees, Dr. Subhash and Dr. Sunit Mukherjee? Dr. Subhash Mukherjee, after the announcement came in Amrita Bazar Patrika, a lot of people visited him and a lot of infertile couples wrote to him because they wanted to get treated. But he was questioned by his own institute and the local government. And then they stopped his research work, transferred him, to an institute when and he ultimately committed suicide on June 19, 1931 at the age of 50. This was where it was a very, very sad day, I would say, in the history of science of India. He was a medical doctor. He was an endocrinologist and a physiologist. On the other hand, his friend, who was a food technologist, but who had the insight of cryopreservation or freezing biological material, 
spent most of his next 40 years of his life in getting justice and recognition for his friend who was considered a fraud which drove him at suicide and therefore till he died on january 4 2020 last year he consistently struggled to keep the memory of dr subhash mukherjee alive and today if we know about the work of dr subhash we cannot forget dr sunit mukherjee because if not for him dr subhash mukherjee's work would never had seen the light of the day how did Dr. Subhash Mukherjee, whose end came in 1981, again got revived? His memories got revived, his words got revived, was doctor, due to Dr. T.C. Anand Kumar. Now, Dr. T.C. Anand Kumar wrote the scientific publication in Current Science entitled Architect of India's First Test to Baby. And since he and Dr. Indira Hinduja were the ones who actually brought about the first IVF baby in India, and on August 6, 1986, and this is Mani Chowda, who, who, uh, and this is the uh, IVF labs. And then this was published in the journal of IVF ET as India's first scientifically documented IVF, which clearly indicated that they, they, they did have some inclination of the reports of Dr. Subhash Mukherjee. However, there was no scientific publication, no scientific evidence, and that is the reason when Dr. Anand Kumar, who was credited with the first, went ahead and wrote this previous paper on Subhash Mukherjee, it was accepted by the scientific community in India, albeit a little resistance, but that the scientific paper clearly emphasized how Dr. Subhash Mukherjee's work was not fictitious, was not imaginary, but was real. And if we were now to look at the work done by Professor Edwards, and which led to the birth of Louis Brown, there were four distinct things that he did. He took the oocyte from the woman, Leslie Brown, in a natural cycle. That is, every woman who ovulates every month would be releasing one follicle from which he aspirated the oocyte. Now, imagine from one follicle getting one oocyte and the chances of pregnancy would be very, very low. He attempted to give hormones so that he would have more oocytes, but that was not working because the lady would need to be given injections of progesterone, which were oil-based and very painful. And that is why he abandoned the effort and collected the zoocyte from a natural cycle. Then the whole procedure was done laparoscopically. That is, they inserted a scope through the navel area and it was a surgical procedure. And then he cultured these oocyte was fertilized with sperms of the husband. And then they were transferred into the uterus on the third day of the cycle when the embryo was about eight cell stage. This led to the birth of Louis Brown. Now, this technique was not very efficient because first and foremost, you know, uh, which and all this he was, he published uh, uh, in this journey, his, his own personal journey on the bumpy road to human IVF. Now, the technique that he used was not very efficient. Because it was not possible that every time you would get an egg from the woman at the right time. And that is why it was essential to give ovarian hormones and stimulate the ovaries. And later, it was about two, three to three years later, the American scientists and gynecologists actually stimulated uh, the women and managed to get twins. And that became the normal modality of treating women for infertility through IVF. And even today, 43 years later, all the clinics in the world, I would say majority, 99.9% .9 clinics in the world, stimulate the woman to get multiple oocytes so that you have chances of pregnancy are higher when you have more embryos and you can freeze them. Then there was this Australian scientist who improved the culture conditions because not all the oocytes that we got managed to develop into embryos. And if the success rate was hardly 5 to 6%, when Alan Trounson worked to improve the culture uh, conditions, he managed to get more embryos. And then you could not transfer all the embryos back to the uterus because that would lead to multiple pregnancies. So he evolved the techniques of freezing these embryos and transferring them in, uh, into the same woman in the subsequent cycles. And thus IVF techniques improved and pregnancy rates improved from the initial 5-6% to what it is today, 50%. Even today, we follow these same techniques. We follow cryopreservation, although the technique used for cryopreservation has modified in the last 10, 15 years. And his work was published again in one of the highest rate scientists nature. So as we go on, these techniques, if you look at what Dr. Subhash Mukherjee did, which was discovered by Dr. Anand Kumar by going through his diaries, he had stimulated the woman using ovarian stimulation with gonadotrophins or hormones which, as we realized, was done in 1981 by the American scientist. 
he had used the vaginal route for oocyte aspiration which was unthought of in those times and the vaginal route for aspiration was first time used later in 1986 and this is what we use even today we aspirate oocytes through the vaginal route he he said that we needed to incubate the oocytes for at least 4 hours before we could inseminate them this is in the conventional ivf that we do today he still pre incubate the oocyte before adding the sperms and he cryo preserved the embryos for 53 days and transferred them after in the subsequent cycle and this is exactly what is done even today although the techniques of cryo preservation have improved so one can see and that what was done by the british american and australian scientists was actually done by dr subhash mukherjee at least 5 to 6 years before they did it so if we do and where did he do all this work as dr manisha had said we don't need fancy equipment this work was done in a makeshift lab which was created on the ground floor of his own house he even had an animal facility where he did these experiments and all the freezing was done using dry ice and alcohol this is where dr sumit mukherjee helped him and then these embryos were stored and this is the picture of the incubator in which this work was being done and we see the result of his work even today after 43 years so he was a scientist who was far 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 ahead of his times he stimulated the ovaries the credit the scientific community gives for the first is to dr professor uh, howard and georgiana jones in 1981 he was the fund for the vaginal approach to retrieve oocyte that was first done in 1986 delaying oocyte uh, insemination and cryo preservation 1982 1983 so you can see by 1981 dr subhash mukherjee was not even existing but all the work that he did in 1976 77 was done by international scientists much later it is extremely sad that he not only did not get his due his credit and maybe he could have done much more and given much more to science but as one says truth prevails and the questions and in fact what were, what happened was that a committee was formed questioning that all his work was fraudulent which he could not accept he fought it he asked him how did you get the gonadotropins he had the answers for that he had even kept the covers of the vials from which the gonadotropins were were got they asked him how did you freeze the embryos calcutta has power supply problems but he had not used electricity at all he had used dry ice and alcohol and then they said you know when you heat to seal the ampules but he had not used heat to seal the ampules and then they thought liquid nitrogen would escape and it would not be possible so the committee that was formed was ignorant but arrogant and unfortunately he could not satisfy the committee which transferred him to an i institute and for a passionate reproductive biologist and an endocrinologist it was possibly something that he could not handle while there were hundreds of infertile couples seeking his help he could not help them because he did not have the material and it was a said and to the story of dr subhash in 1981 but as one says truth always prevails and the truth came out much later in 1995 and finally for the first time kanupriya on her birthday i uh, in on her 25th birthday actually came to bangalore with dr anand kumar and we have the icmr uh, dr vasanta muttuswami and that is when actually the whole world got to know about the existence of kanupriya and the general public also got to know how great a scientist we had in india so i at the end i would like to thank dr sunith mukherjee who actually kept the light of dr subhash mukherjee alive if not for him if not for his persistence he could not have provided the material to dr anand kumar to do the research and if not for that we would have never known all the greatness of dr subhash mukherjee so i would like to thank dr smita male the ex director of icmr dr shrabani dr mr ram and mr balachandra who have helped us tremendously in archiving all the material and scanning and deepa for rec recording it so thank you very much and i i once again i'm very happy to be part of this fantastic 90th birthday celebration and i'm sure the more and more the world should know about the work of this great indian scientist and thank you shrabani and the rest of the team for helping us organize this over to you deepak thank you thank you so much rajvi that was wonderful taking us through the journey of dr mukaji and whenever i give talks about i we have always make a point that we compare the two and show that how dr mukaji was well ahead of his time well ahead in terms of not just ivf but ivf which is in practice today 
Dr. Shabani Mukherjee is a scientist at ICMR NIRRH and she heads a program on polycystic ovarian syndrome and has immensely contributed towards expanding our understanding of this common disease. She's also the part of national program on clinical and epidemiological aspects of PCOS. And uh, she took the leadership role in archiving the information of Dr. Mukherjee. And on this journey of hers, she learned many new things about Dr. Mukherjee, which some of us, and even me, I wasn't aware of. So uh, over to you, Shabani, who is going to tell us more about Dr. Mukherjee, Dr. Mukherjee beyond IBS. Shabani, please. Thank you, Deepak. And thank everybody for joining us today on the great occasion of 90th celebration of Dr. Sunit, uh, Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee. Uh, so uh, you heard Rajvi now about his contribution in the field of IVF. Uh, apart from IVF, he was also has a lot of research interest in the other area. I will share some of those with you. So he first started his research activity at the, uh, during his PhD at Department of Physiology, Presidency College, Calcutta University, under the guidance of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sachitananda Banerjee and he worked on biochemical changes is normal and abnormal pregnancy, preeclampsia, toxemia. And uh, incidentally, I am also from the same department and I came to know regarding this when I started working on this project. So during he, his PhD, he observed that there is increased level of glutathione and ascorbic acid and uh, decreased level of glutathione and ascorbic acid and increased level of the dehydroascorbic acid in the abnormal pregnancy. And he hypothesized that this glutathione level is decreased due to binding to some toxins. And today we know these toxins are the reactive oxygen uh, substances. He, uh, after that in 1960, he tied his knot with um, Nomita Banerjee and then uh, he got awarded uh, for uh, he got awarded with the um, fellowship to go to the Edinburgh and to work under the Professor John Laurel in the Clinical Endocrine Research Lab, where he worked uh, on the different development of the different assay of the gonadotropin, and he did his second PhD over there. He successfully developed a very uh, sensitive LH assay method on ovarian cholesterol depletion test using intact wrapped ovaries treated with PMSG and which is more sensitive than the earlier assay which was the ovarian ascorbic acid depletion method. In 1967, he returned to India and joined NRS Medical Hospital where he used to stay in the first floor apartment. In the ground floor in an empty room he developed his animal house, which included rat, mice, rabbit, guinea pig, and monkeys also. And he used to spend all his spare time experimenting all this animal. He also worked extensively on the origin of the HCG and its extragonadal effect. We all know that the androgens, the male hormones, uh, excess leads to the development of the infertility and PCO is being one of them. He was very much interested to uh, study the effect of the androgen on the female reproduction. He used animal model for that, where he treated the rats with testosterone and DHEs and observed that these hormones induce luteotropic, uh, luteotropic and eutrotropic effect. DHEA treatment also increases the size and number of the follicles. Then in uh, women who are having luteal phase insufficiency, he measured the testosterone level, which was really low. Then he treated this woman with the testosterone and the uh, length of the luteal phase increased and the progesterone level increased. So today we know that DHEA is highly used in the IVF setup uh, for the women who are having uh, poor response, responders. And that, but bad point of time, uh, nobody believed Shubhash Mukherjee when he suggested that uh, male hormone can be used for the management of the female infertility. And this is a handwritten note of his uh, about the luteotropic effect of testosterone. He also worked on the testicular feminization syndrome, which today known as the androgen insensitivity syndrome, 
uh, he reported four cases, three of them are familiar, and he did an extensive study on them and published paper in the Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology in 1973. Today we know PCO is a uh, emerging health problem globally. Uh, many women or many girls face a sudden increase in the weight gain, uh, hirsutism, acne, then irregular menses, everything, which are the different symptoms of the PCOS. Um, and Dr. Mukherjee was very much interested in PCOS and he worked extensively using the animal model and also on human. At that time, he developed a rat model of PCOs using neonatal androgenization, which were not cycling infertile. He performed, uh, he removed one of the ovary and he could see that the cyclicity restored and many of the uh, rat become fertile. So he carried out then the bilateral wedge resection on the woman with the PCOs and he measured the gonadotropin and steroid before and after the wedge resection and he shown that after wedge resection the hormonal levels come back to the normal so he concluded that if we can reduce the testosterone somehow uh, we can revert the pcos to the normal he meticulously noted all the cases and he noted that many women before the onset of the PCO symptom, they have extensive emotional stress. Based on this, that time he hypothesized that you know, emotional stress may hyperactive the hypothalamus pituitary androgen axis and through uh, release of excess androgen, DHEA and androstenedione, it may lead to the development of the PCOs and infertility in this woman, which he presented at the International Congress on Physiology Science in 1997 in Paris. Today we know there are a lot of manuscript is coming out acknowledging the relationship between the stress and PCOs. So we can understand how Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee was ahead of his time proposed this thing way back. The sum of his notes on the stress that he has jotted down in his uh, notebooks. Apart from reproduction field, he was a very caring person and he was very concerned about human health and suffering. During the Bangladesh war in 1971, a lot of uh, refugee migrant to India and there was scarcity of the uh, nutrient food. So they were suffering from malnutrition. So Dr. Mukherjee took up a trial where he provided the fish protein concentrated supplemented in their food, uh, which he got from the Norway, which has 80% protein and uh, it was well accepted and this way he could uh, combat the malnutrition in this refugees. And he published to the paper and he proposed to the Bangladesh government that there were plenty of fish in the Bangladesh. So they try to concentrate the fish protein concentrate and use as a supplement to combat the malnutrition in the country. He also helped the Marine Product Development Authority who used to supply freshly frozen frog legs to the Southeast Asia, but due to salmonella contamination, their exports were rejected many a times. So with his surgical skill, he helped them to develop a method how to dissect the frog legs without cutting the intestine to prevent the contamination. And thus he helped them to combat the problem with them. And this method he patented later on. This is the schematic diagram which shows how he developed the method to cut the frog legs for the export. Such a simple thing, but he, due to his excellent skill and surgery, he could develop the method. So I will share with you some of the photographs. Uh, these two are with uh, his wife, Nandita Mukherjee. And this is in front of the Victoria Memorial in Calcutta. And this one is with his colleagues in the Bakura Samilani Medical College when he used to work over there. This is some of the pictures uh, from the conferences where he presented his paper. This is with, doc with Sunit Mukherjee, his friend for his lifetime. He also received some of the awards later on. Uh, this is the trophy presented by the 
Brazilian Medical Society on the 30th IVF uh, occasion to Shubhash Mukherjee Memorial Center. And his name was listed in the Dictionary of Medical Biography, which is published by World Foundation, which has listed 1100 medical doctors who has immensely contributed in the field of medicine over 2500 years. And here you can see the photograph again, which Rajvi showed uh, just a few months back. This is Anand Kumar. This is Kanupriya, who is here with us today. And this is Dr. Vasantha Muthusamy from ICMR. So now coming to Dr. Sunit Mukherjee, if we don't talk about Sunit Mukherjee, it will, because of Dr. Sunit Mukherjee, we came to know about Shubhash Mukherjee. Uh, here, you can see a young Sunit Mukherjee who used to uh, play sitar. Uh, he was himself a professor in the food and uh, food technology and uh, chemical engineering in the Jadapur University. And uh, he helped Shubhash Mukherjee not only in the freezing the embryo, but because of his persuasion, we today we know about Shubhash Mukherjee. And we met him in the Shubhash Mukherjee Memorial Center in the Behala, myself and Rajvi. And uh, there he kept all his belongings, his handwritten notes, his uh, diaries, his um, thesis of his students, everything, photographs, everything. He kept, he tried to preserve everything. When we went and met him, he asked us, please take it and give it uh, the due respect and archive it properly. And last year, 2020 and 4 January, we lost him. These are the photographs of uh, Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee Memorial Oration Lecture. He initiated with uh, at 1983 with the Cryogenic Society. Uh, and uh, here you can see different doctors. This is Dr. Gautam Kastogir. Here, uh, Kanupriya is there. And here, Dr. Mahale. He delivered the oration lecture in 2019 in Shubhash Mukherjee Memorial um, Center. And here you can see Dr. Mahale with uh, Shamiji of Ramakrishna Mission and uh, father of Anupriya, Mr. Prabhash Agarwal. So this is the uh, laboratory of Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee's work where kept. This is the Shubhash Mukherjee Memorial Reproductive Biology Research Center at Behala, Kolkata, uh, where Sunit Mukherjee used to work. He used to come every day, not uh, also in the all the Sundays and he used to work over there when we met her in last two years he used to come there every day and do some food processing uh, experiment over there and this is the team from NIRRH myself Rajvi with Dr. Sunit Mukherjee and here is uh, Mr. Balachandra and Mr. Ram who help us scanning and getting all the material we spent almost seven days together over there to get all the material now, uh, Shubhash Mukherjee was not only interested in science, he was a, a prolific writer and used to sketch a lot. So this is one of his sketch of Madonna. He has written, I draw picture of life Madonnas with hormones. This depicts the hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis. And I would like to end my talk to, uh, with one of his quotation. It is science and technology which brings social revolution. So thank you, everybody. Thank you uh, so much, Shabini. Uh, as a reproductive biologist, I wonder about the vision of Dr. Mukherjee. Several things which we now investigate using animal models, he had already done it then. And the results which he had seen that time are even corrected. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And uh, thank you and Rajvi for actually archiving all this. And I think it's a treasure which we all must cherish and see how uh, Indian science was so great and it has grown to what it is uh, today. Uh, with so many minimal tools that he had that time, with a very small laboratory and probably very minimal funding or almost no funding has achieved things which we just even think of them um, today. The fascinating story of Dr. Mukherjee and the credit uh, given to him by Dr. Anand Kumar are compiled in form of a book. 
Now we know that uh, uh, this is done by uh, 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 this book, which was there. Uh, the, this fascinating story of about Dr. Anand Kumar and um, uh, Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee is also compiled in form of a book. Uh, the book is called as uh, Two Beautiful Minds, Untold Story of IVF in Manishin. This is authored by Dr. Sumit Mukherjee, a close aide of uh, Mukhopadhyay, the closest aide of Dr. Mukherjee, and Dr. Sadhan Kumar Day. It is our honor that Professor uh, Day is amongst the former faculty of IIT Karakpur, is uh, one of the authors and is amongst us with us today. And it is, it is going to be wonderful to hear about him uh, from uh, Dr. Uh, Day himself. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Day, please. Dr. Day, are you there? Can you please unmute yourself? Okay. Hello? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Can you see me also? No, your video is off still. Start the video, okay. Okay. Can I start now? Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir, please, sir. We can see you as well as hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, I can, I can start, right? Okay. And I am very thankful to all the members of the uh, ICM and the Institute, Dr. Uh, uh, Sony and Dr. Rajmirta and others for inviting me. You know, I am very new to this uh, area. And uh, I, I, I am I was more interested in writing a short story uh, after my retirement, and I was writing uh, stories on the transgenders, and there I came to know about the uh, about the I don't know IVF and all those things, and I heard about Dr. Subhas Mukherjee when I was in Kharagpur. So after retirement uh, from Kharagpur, I came to Calcutta, and I wanted to learn about the details of. The story of Dr. Subhas Mukherjee from uh, Professor Sunit Mukhopadhyay. But by that time, he has left uh, Jadupur University. I, I did not have any address whatsoever of Professor Sunit uh, uh, Mukhopadhyay. So I went to Jadupur University, uh, food technology department. Uh, he was the head of the department. And I, one old person, Clark, he gave me the address and phone number. He gave me the phone number. So I called him. He said that, yes, I am. Uh, Sunit Mukhopadhyay, I am. You can come anytime, any day between 11 to 5. But I said that I will come just now. So I went there, met him, and I have interacted him with him for one year. And uh, I have written a book with him, Bengali. And uh, he wanted a book to be written in English. So we started uh, to write a book in English. And uh, uh, when we started the work, he fell sick. And uh, uh, unfortunately, he passed away. But uh, uh, he asked me to complete the, in his deathbed. He told me that you can complete the work. So I have completed the work, and uh, I have uh, written the book Two Beautiful Minds." I completed this work, and this is a this is a tribute to Dr. Uh, Sunit Mukhopadhyay. So you know, he have asked me to. Uh, talk about uh, Dr. Subhash Mukherjee, the man and his life. Dr. Subhash Mukherjee was born on 16th of January 1931 in his maternal uncle's house at Hajaribagh, now in Jharkhand. He did his basic honors in Presidency College, Calcutta, MBBS from National Medical College, Calcutta. He stood first in uh, gynecology and received the Mangani Award. He earned a rare feat of two PhDs from Calcutta University and Edinburgh University. After doing his PhD and then post PhD work from England, he returned to India and uh, he spent about eight years in Nilatan Sarkar Medical College from 67 to 1975. He was a physiologist, a gynecologist, and endocrinologist. 
He succeeded in build a building, he succeeded in building a research environment. Several doctors and research scholars did their PhDs under his guidance. Subhash Mukherjee got himself immersed in research, had no time to think about his own family. He convinced his wife, we shall not have children, since I shall not be able to spare time for family at the cost of my research. Dr. Sunil Pine, his friend, asked Dr. Mukherjee, Subhash, you are bringing cheers to the childless couples, but there is no babble in your own home. Is it not an injustice to Namita, your wife? Subhash replied, I do not have any quality to lead a family life. Now I have the mentality to become the father of a child. I feel delighted seeing children at my friend's home. I feel intoxicated by the search work and forget about my family. I am being constantly hit by the research ideas as if some invisible someone instigate hurdles, neglect, insult, politics in all spheres, the country is not making headway to nail Ayan court. About Subhash Nomad's mention, he is workaholic, knows nothing beyond his research and laboratory. When he eats, what he eats, what? Once Subhash told me he would return by 1 p.m. and take lunch together, he returned at 4 p.m. In the beginning, I got upset and felt bad. Now I have adjusted. He's like a saint leading a family life. He's helpless, does not understand anything of domestic affairs. He's fully dependent on me. When he just started his research on IVF, test to baby, Dr. Mukherjee was transferred to Bakura Medical College in 1975. He built a small clinic in his Calcutta flat in South Calcutta, and he used, his, he used to visit his Calcutta residence at weekends and meet his patients in his residence and continued his research on IPF. Once after returning from Bakura, the absent-minded Subhash entered into the adjacent building, Sharobar. He tried to open the flat number 5C there, but it was not his flat. His flat 5C was in the next building, Avenue House. So he's so absent-minded. One evening, dropping his wife, Namita, at Billa Academy of Art and Culture for a function, Shuhas told his wife, I will come at 9 p.m. and pick you. Meanwhile, I shall be at Jodhpur Park, residence of our friend, Sunil. And he, <clears throat> his friends did not know he was to leave at 9 p.m. to pick up Navita. Three hours have passed. It was midnight, 12 o'clock. Then he remembered that he was supposed to pick Navita. He hurriedly left. Navita was waiting for three hours for him, sitting on a marble slab outside the gate of Billa Academy. And the security darwan was standing nearby for her safety. Of course, the security staff scolded him for the irresponsible act. Mrs. Sumita Roy, one of Dr. Mukherjee's patients in 1970, recalled how different was Subhash Mukherjee from other doctors. He, she said, I met, incidentally, I met Sumita Roy in the condolence meeting of after the death of Professor Sunit Mukhavadda at Jadupur University. To quote Sunita Roy, we could not succeed in having a baby even after four years of marriage. Dr. Mukherjee first poked a fun at me in presence of my husband, telling me, I was an ideal woman for Indian family planning program because my ovaries were not healthy enough to create and release enough eggs. So we started laughing. My husband also laughed. So ma he made us very easy. And then he prescribed one injection to induce ovulation. And after the said injection protocol, I became pregnant same year. And my first child, a daughter, was born in April 1971.
according to Sumita Roy, she said, I have never seen, I do not know whether God exists. She said, but I have experienced godliness in Dr. Subhas Mukherjee. He used to love his students. One in a final Bhayabhose examination, one professor of the medical college was asking a student top question, but that student answered all. Then the professor started asking tougher questions until the boy failed to answer one question. Then only the professor looked very happy and asked the boy to leave. But Dr. Subhash Mukherjee asked the boy to sit down and explain to him the answer to the last question. Later, he told the professor, if a student cannot answer a question, we should tell them the answer. Otherwise, they will never know the answer. Our job should be not to harass them by asking them tougher questions. We should teach them if they fail to answer any question. He was an excellent teacher. His interaction with the students continued beyond the lecture period as over. I have been told by many of his past students who are now very senior that his class was so interesting that the, that the lecture room was overflowed with students. On 25th of July, 1978, the first test to baby was born in the world, Lucy Brown, as you have heard. And on, on 3rd October, the second test to baby, Durga or Tanupriya was born in Calcutta nursing home. Tanupriya was called the second test to baby, but actually she is the first test to baby born out of a frozen embryo. And this is the method that is ap uh, applicable now in all the infertility clinics. While there was a great interest around the world in the birth of the first IVF baby from a frozen embryo, ignorance and jealousy propelled a group of gynecologists in Calcutta to start a campaign against Dr. Subhas Mukherjee in collusion with the state government bureaucracy, stating that Dr. Mukherjee was a cheat and birth of Durga or Kanupriya was hoax. The left front state government of West Bengal refused to recognize Dr. Mukherjee's research. He was prevented from attending any conferences, visiting abroad to present his research work to the international scientific community. He had a heart attack, a massive heart attack in the summer of 1980. After the state government rejected his research results, he told, it is okay, it is fine, don't believe it, I will do it again. That's how the science works. I will show, I will repeat again. I will create more Kanupriyas and more Durgas. He wanted to create more test to babies, but he was prevented. In order to prevent him from carrying out further work in IBA by creating more test to babies, he was transferred to, an, to the third floor of an eye hospital where there is no facilities to enable him to pursue his work. His patient snapped, publicly ridiculed and humiliated by the institutionally backed vilifiers lobby, Dr. Subhash Mukherjee committed suicide by hanging in his South Calcutta residence on 19th of June, 1981. And India lost its, one of its most brilliant and beautiful minds. He was only 50 years old. The period 1981 to 1981 to 1997, a difficult period, dark days for his wife, Nomita Mukherjee, and colleague come friend, Sunit Mukherjee. Journalist Shati Bhattacharya wrote, Dr. Subhash Mukherjee would have remained disregarded unless struggle Dr. Sunit Mukhopadhyay put a bold front with his dedication and sacrifice and fought almost a lonely battle in order to exonerate Suhas from all sorts of lies and defamation and retrieve the credit which has been due to him. Mondira Nayar of Week wrote, to, wrote about Sunit's pain, the pain inside. Imagine having been part of creating history and then have, having to hide it like a dirty secret because everyone thought it was a lie. Meanwhile, back in 1986, under the leadership of Dr. T.C. Anand Kumar, director of the Institute of Research and Reproduction in Bombay, 
and KU Hospital in Bombay jointly created the first scientifically documented test tube baby in India named Harsha under an ICM SAMR sponsored project. In 1996, Professor Sanit Mukhopadhyay handed over to Dr. Anand Kumar all documents in record to Dr. Subhas Mukherjee's research in order to judge the veracity of Dr. Mukherjee's research. Dr. Anand Kumar took time. He meticulously scrutinized all documents, including his handwritten laboratory diary, published unpublished research papers, invitational letters from India and abroad, all correspondence with the state government, transfer orders, denial of permission to go to abroad, etc., etc. He also met Mrs. Namita Mukherjee and test to baby Kanupriya's parents, Prabhat Kumar Agarwal and Bela Devi Agarwal, and the Kanupriya herself when she was 18 years old. On 8 February 1997, Calcutta in Calcutta Science City Auditorium, while delivering Dr. Subhas Mukherjee Memorial Lecture in the Third National Congress on Assisted Reproductive Technology, Dr. Anand Kumar announced. There is no doubt in my mind that Subhas Mukherjee is the creator of the first test to baby in India. Myself and my associates followed Dr. Mukherjee and created a test to baby Harshra in 86. We are not the first. We are the second. Besides, the majority of IVF clinics in the world follow the procedure invented by Dr. Subhas Mukherjee. Dr. Mukherjee's methods has higher success rate, easy and safe to be compared as compared to the method of Dr. Steptoe and Dr. Edwards, who created world's first test to baby in England. Dr. Anand Kumar has the courage to research Dr. Subhas Mukherjee's findings and scientifically present it to the world, giving Dr. Subhas Mukherjee his due place in medical history. If truth stands for beauty, Dr. Anand Kumar is indeed a beautiful mind. Dr. Anand Kumar spent more than a decade towards the end of his life 1997 honors on cementing the fact that Shuvas is pioneered in IPF. Actually, Anand Kumar has given rebirth of Shuvas Mukherjee in 1997. Professor Sunit Mukhopadhyay spent about a decade in the early part of his life collaborating with Shuvas Mukherjee in his IPF work, particularly in cryophasing and thawing of embryos. In latter life, Sunit spent more than a decade with Dr. T.C. Anand Kumar in his fight to uphold the truth and legacy of Dr. Subhas Mukherjee in IVF and became Dr. Anand Kumar's friend. Professor Sunit Mukhopadhyay acted as an intermediary between the genius of Subhas, dedicated to the service of the humanity, and a noble hearted Dr. Anand Kumar, dedicated to bring the truth in the open so that the genius is made known to the outside world. Sunit became witness in the surreal union of two beautiful minds. Dr. Sunit, Dr. Sunit, Mukherjee, sorry, Dr. Sunit Mukherjee became witness in the surreal union of two beautiful minds, Dr. Subhas Mukherjee and Dr. T.C. Anand Kumar. Dr. Anand Kumar passed away on 26 January 2010 at the age of 74. Post heart attack, Shubhas lost self confidence. He asked his friend Sunit that in case of early death, Sunit would have to take care of his wife, Namita, so that she could face no difficulty. Sunit could not deny. She could not say no. Sunit looked after Namita after, during the dark period of her life after the untimely death of her husband. Durga or Kanupriya was the result of Shubhash's research. Nomita used to say, Durga is my husband's only child. Nomita's health started deteriorating at late 90s. Sunit Mukherjee left his Behala residence and shifted to Southern Avenue residence of Subhash Mukherjee to look after Nomita's nursing, diet, and overall supervision. Since 2002, Nomita fell ill, partly paralyzed, frail, and almost bedridden since then over a decade. Pins Phil, Pins, Mr. Philip Matthew of the week wrote, five minutes in the Mukherjee house, and you realize the magnitude of sacrifice they have made. 
the wife of the man who was one of the pioneers in the IPF process, that is money spinner today, lies in bed, untouched by any benefit. Wrapped up in sadness, in sadness all along, her only relief is that her husband is no longer believed to be a fraud. He was once made out to be. On 31st of May 2005, the Health Department of the West Bengal government issued an order to set up an institute of research for deep production and stem cell in memory of Dr. Subhas Mukherjee. Here, Dr. Anand Kumar made a blueprint of the said institute, but nothing happened. Where did you Nomita would tell her visitors? I pray to see the institute before breathing my last. This is the only reason what I am still alive. Her prayer was, however, not heard. As the years passed by, the institute remained in her dream and in the file of Shasta Bhavan, housing the health department of West Bengal government. Nomita Mukherjee died on 12th July 2014 at the age of 78. After Nomita's death, Sunit left the Southern Avenue residence of Subhas and shifted to Thakur Pugu residence of his niece, Deepa Chakravarti. Sunit did not have a family on, of his own. He remained a bachelor. He spent almost 50 years of his life for the cause of his friend, Dr. Subhas, Dr. Subhas Mukherjee. When Dr. Subhas was being vilified by his own peers, and the government of West Bengal denying him permission to attend a seminar in Japan. He was asked, Dr. Mukherjee, do you plan to leave India and do research abroad? Shubhash replied, I do not intend to work anywhere else but in India. I love my country. Indian abroads are often looked down upon in a derogatory manner. It is for people like us to convince the world that we are equal, if not better. Dr. Subhash Mukherjee was a true patriot. He loved his motherland, but our country has not been forthcoming in recognizing a rare talent, a beautifully minded scientist doctor who sacrificed his family and himself for the sake of humanity. And he continues to remain an unsung, unsung hero. We wonder if Dr. Subhas Mukherjee, the inventor of IVF, which made a worldwide, worldwide revolution in medical technology, is not awarded Bharat Ratno posthumously. Who else could be a better candidate than Dr. Subhas Mukherjee? Thank you very much. At the end, I would like to show you the uh, book. I think you have already seen. And... That's all I have to say. This book can be public, uh, available online, and uh, and from uh, you know, and I can show you the online. You can purchase online from Thinkers Lane. You can call Thinkers Lane Gmail dot com, and this is their uh, WhatsApp number, uh, telephone number. So anybody interested to get the details of the story of the three persons, here I have written two beautiful minds, but uh, at that time, you know, Sunit Mukhavadai was still alive and we have jointly done it. And it is our dream. And uh, true, true picture, true nomenclature will be a story of three beautiful minds. Subhash Mukherjee, Dr. Anand Kumar and Sunit Mukhavadai. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Day, for taking us through the minute-by-minute -minute life of Dr. Mukaji, Dr. Sunit Mukhopadhyay, and Dr. Namita. We are really, really in debt to you, uh, Shatanda. It's, it's really, really wonderful. We, we could really get through the whole scenario. I mean, those streets of Calcutta and the whole place almost came in life in front of us. Thank you so much. Someone so special, someone who makes us proud, someone whose birth is special and it's marking the beginning of a new era. 
She's none other than Kanupriya, the first SG baby in India, the living proof of Dr. Mukherjee's work. And she, as Dr. Day has said, everybody refers to her, or at least Namita Mam used to refer to her as Dr. Mukherjee's only child. It is such a matter of pride for us to have you here. I, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the living legend and the creation of Kanupriya and uh, Kanupriya Agarwal Didwanya. Aka Durga, Anupriya, over to you, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I always feel very humbled and uh, wonder why I'm around so, so many uh, brilliant minds. Uh, and I, I get invited to these uh, scientific spaces, which, uh, yes, it increases my own knowledge. And uh, honestly, every time I go, I, I discover a little more uh, about how I was made. Uh, so uh, I think uh, from a very over from you know the historical perspective and the scientific uh, uh, perspective uh, i think uh, it's it's important to also see uh, how the uh, the patient side of everything uh, and what i think uh, whenever i've been to one of these lectures and there are some patients around or some doctors around uh, i've always come to be told that you know uh, how is it that you're, you're taking it so coolly and you know uh, so many of our patients don't even want to see us after and things like that which I find very strange uh, in today's time. Uh, you know, if it would have happened uh, long, long ago, like in my parents' time, uh, India was different, uh, culture was different, and uh, uh, and I wonder why uh, it is not like that. Uh, I think uh, the question which I get asked the most is, when did you realize you were uh, a test tube baby and how did that make you feel? Uh, to me, it's a very uh, funny question. Because I think from uh, forever, I always knew I was a test tube baby. I just didn't know what it meant. You know how uh, you know kids in India are brought up, and you know it's, it's nice to tell young uh, people. And you know, uh, I used to be, I used to go to um, uh, Namita Ma's house uh, very often, and they used to come and uh, meet us at uh, at home very often. And I used to be like a shy kid, and she used to come bring me sweets or a book or some such thing, and. Uh, we used to go to their house every year, twice a year, on uh, today, uh, which is uh, Dr. Mukherjee's birthday and his death anniversary. And there used to be a, a talk of, of some sorts. And on some uh, occasions, uh, we used to go. And, you know, you always wonder as a child, you're curious. Who are these people? How are we related? Why are we going there? Now that I'm a mom of a eight-year-old, I know the kind of questions I must have asked at that time. And uh, they were very upfront. I mean... The one thing that you can count on kids to do is to be resilient. You know, they are, and also uh, everything is so new to them. The whole world is new, right? I mean, you're just born in a, you know, what, four, five, six years old. Everything is new. A tree is new. An animal is new. So if somebody told me I was test tube baby, huh, okay, uh, that must be the normal thing as well. Uh, you're not really told how kids are born at that age. So it just seems normal. Uh, so you grow up with it. And then when you reach an age where, uh, you know, your, your friends, your relatives and other people uh, talk about it, uh, it could get embarrassing for some people. But I think it's about how your parents deal with it. Uh, I think I got, uh, I'm blessed uh, with a family and people around me. I have only got love. Uh, I, uh, nobody has ever asked me a strange question uh, of, you know, uh, I, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's being polite in India or, uh, or not being intrusive. We are not very intrusive about people's health and everything. So I think it could be that. But honestly, I think uh, it's, it's been very clear since day one. And I, and I would suggest to everybody who's a non-scientific person and who's thinking of having an IVF child or has an IVF child to tell them as soon as possible. Uh, they'll, they'll have no repercussions of it at all. It, uh, it kind of helps you deal with it later on. I was not treated as special. I had a bruised knee. I would jump up and down. And yes, I'm sure my mom held her breath every time that happened. And I'm told that when my inoculations were happening when I was, you know, just a baby of one year old and all of that time, Dr. Subhash Mukherjee was more particular about it than my mom was. Uh, I think that helped. Uh, my parents weren't uh, scientific so to say. So uh, they did all the culturally right things for me. I got my ears pierced when I was, I think, three. Uh, so I think all the normal things happened uh, because they wanted they wanted life to be normal. Uh, they wanted a normal child and, and that's how they dealt with it. Uh, so I think uh, that's how it should be. Uh, uh, I'm living proof, I think, that uh, 
I I carry all the hereditary problems and the accolades, but uh, nothing else. So uh, for every family out there who's wondering, the second problem that happens usually is inhibition by the mother or the father uh, to not have had a natural child, so to say. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, once the child comes along, uh, it's such a joy that I think that gets overlooked completely. Uh, we have families with, you know, uh, adopted children, uh, surrogate children, um, IVF uh, of, you know, your, the, the mother and father, is, where the mother's carried the child, it really doesn't matter. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a life in your, uh, in, your, in your world is going to give you so much joy that uh, I don't think it should matter at all. Um, the other thing that uh, comes up is that will they have any health issues? You know, did some cell get left behind while it was thawing or some such thing? Those are the kind of funny questions that I used to be thrown at. And no, nothing gets left behind. Uh, I think uh, the likes of the doctors that are on this call make sure of that. Uh, the social pressures, and, and I fully appreciate and agree to what uh, Dr. Kash Mukherjee said, that science is what changes social culture and society. Uh, the fact that, you know, today uh, people have a choice of whether they want to have a child or not uh, is fantastic. So, you know, the fact that, you know, you're not, it's not a biological problem anymore that, you know, I have to have a child or I cannot have a child because I'm, I mean, it's, it's a choice. It's, you know, and I think that's fantastic. That's what science gives us. It gives you a choice to exercise, uh, to be able to do what you want to do. So, hey, do it and I think uh, talk about it. Uh, um, Sunit Mukherjee, Subhash Mukherjee, Anand Kumar did that for about, you know, I think 100 years put together. And uh, and I think uh, that, that's really nice. Uh, I have um, honestly uh, uh, nothing to add about Dr. Subhash Mukherjee except that I'm so happy that we are all meeting today on his birthday rather than on my birthday, uh, which, uh, uh, which I think is how it should be. Uh, if he wasn't there, honestly, I wouldn't be here. So, uh, uh, a little happy birthday to him and uh, thank you for all the sacrifices that he's made not just that all the um, i think all the leaps of faith that he's taken and the courage that he took uh, to you know to really just uh, make it happen uh, it, it, that's what it is and he he was very very open with mama and papa i think that's uh, what's very important i mean none of them uh, Sunit Mukherjee, Subhash Mukherjee, um, Namita, ma'am, uh, Mama, Papa, nobody ever said anything wrong. I was shown the uh, the fridge that Rajvi showed a picture of uh, physically. I was that, you know, that you were here when you were a cell old. And uh, uh, the nitrogen chamber where, you know, the, uh, the test was actually put. Uh, so it was nice. Uh, I think uh, kids should know where they come from. It's a part of my identity. And the earlier you accept it and make it part of it, uh, uh, it's who I am, it's, it's, uh, and it's fine to be like that. So I think uh, honesty is, uh, is is really good in this case. Uh, you'd rather hear it from your parents and people who you love, who you can ask questions to rather than a stranger popping up and saying it in the, in the rudest way. Uh, so I think uh, that's nice. Uh, my friends took it in a, in, in a very, very nice way. I think everybody enjoys the fact and, and says they know a celebrity, but uh, uh, it keeps me grounded as well because I'm treated as one of them, not as somebody who's different uh, in any aspect. So I would encourage everybody to do that. Um, uh, and thank you very much for uh, organizing this space uh, where I can again uh, relive what they would have gone through at that time. Uh, and uh, thank you for continuing the research and you know giving. Uh, I hope I gave my parents joy, <laughs> so giving joy to uh, so many more uh, uh, more couples. Uh, and if any uh, couple feels that you know the children ask strange questions, maybe point them to my Facebook. I've had quite a normal life, so uh, that's it from me. Unless anybody has any questions or want me to uh, either talk about Navita Mukherjee or Sadiq Mukherjee, I have no recollection. I'm sorry of, of Dr. Subhash Mukherjee. It's too young. I I miss that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kanupriya. It's been, I mean, I'm in goosebumps right now, actually watching the creation of uh, Dr. Mukherjee. It's, it's such a wonderful feeling. I'm sure Dr. Mahle has said that there are not going to be any questions, but being the host of the program, I think I can take that privilege and ask you that, uh, how do you feel even today? I mean, I can, I can see your expressions, I can get through. But now coming at this stage when you are, you know, at the, when you're getting all the attention, 
I mean, you look back in history, you know, there are these two different things. And how, 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 how do you cope up with this now? Um, uh, I think I'm a very extroverted person. Uh, and also, I think my parents kept me away from media glare. Uh, I think at the right time, I could get grounded. I mean, you know, one of the two things could have happened. Either it could have got into my head and I could have become one, you know, spoiled celebrity, or it could have, I could have completely shut the world and, you know, not spoken about it at all. Uh, I think I got a great balance of both because of uh, the matter of fact way that my parents handled it. Uh, and so I can handle it like that. I am blessed, uh, I think, uh, by being able to talk about it uh, casually rather than my parents. And I'm sure it comes from the fact that they had to go through a lot. And also a culture and time which was so different. I mean, if our kids can't remember, uh, you know, a generation which didn't have a, a digital cell phone in their hands, I mean, to think of the time when they didn't have, I don't know, there was no Google, there was nothing. And, you know, you had to live in a world uh, where, you know, your, your social community was so small. Uh, you, it, It's very unimaginable to be in that time. Uh, so to manage the fact that, you know, I've been given the privilege of a world which has opened up, we are the millennial uh, world, you know, we've got a lot more going for us than that generation did. Uh, I think that gives you the confidence. Uh, also, uh, they've been, uh, while I come from a very uh, conservative Marwari household, uh, my mom and my grandmom uh, has never treated me as such. My dad did try, I must be honest, but uh, these two have never treated me like that. You know, I got to do uh, anything that I wanted to. I got to study uh, further. I got to marry the person who I wanted to marry. Uh, I got to do everything that I wanted to do. So I think that empowerment helps. Uh, to be able to balance uh, this out. Uh, and honestly, right now, uh, thankfully, I'm, I'm pretty old and there are too many, many more festive babies, so the tension is not that much, which is great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, earlier on, my, my first few times, I used to get like, why do you want to speak to me? Like, I have such a normal, boring life. <laughs> you know? So, uh, but yeah, the journalists used to ask me these strange questions, but there were some really beautiful pieces which I've gotten written uh, thanks to this. And uh, over time, uh, I've had practice, uh, you know, talking to my friends about this and some other journalists. So I think honestly, that's helped uh, people have written books and they've spoken to me and, and all this is very practiced and proper speech now. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. That's been such a wonderful message. And I really love it about talking from the patient perspective, talking from the idea of baby perspective, that how one should be. I think you really are supporting family, which probably is. And then thanks to your parents who have really you know, kind of took the courage and taken this leap of faith. And, and, and uh, thank you so much for being here. It's been a lot of pleasure. And uh, so we know that birth of Kanapuya marks the beginning of a new dawn the era of tested babies in the world. The field has grown in the last 42 years and more than 10 million couples have enjoyed parenthood through this historic technology. Let's hear from Dr. Durusha on the evolution of IVF in India. She definitely needs no introduction. Um, she's an ACE clinician, IVF expert, and a researcher by heart. Uh, she's the founder president of PCO Society and has many, many first two credits. I think I, I would not really waste time, but I request Dr. Shah to begin the presentation. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, you need to unmute yourself. We can't hear you. You're not out of this still now. I am. Okay, thank you so much for having invited me to this program, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. It's been a brilliant uh, session and uh, 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 the speakers have been also very brilliant. And it's something which I have really, really enjoyed. Uh, I was happy to listen to the story about uh, 
uh, about Subhash Mukherjee, which I had never heard before. And I've heard, and I'm really excited to know that we had such a brilliant uh, speaker, I mean, a scientist in Amatsa with uh, MITS. So I'd like to share my presentation with you on what really are we doing today where so many years have passed by. Um, today we have a situation wherein there's a fascinating story about how, how all of this has evolved and how this has all given rise to uh, decades and decades of work which has gone on both before the first IVF baby and what's happening in the world today. So I quickly go back to Patrick Stepto and Robert Edwards, who everyone has talked about and who were the first pioneers or the architects of IVF. And they published their first paper on laparoscopy and ovulation in The Lancet in 1968. And they first aspirated an oocyte laparoscope. So the eggs were removed through the laparoscope in their days. Robert Edwards was the embryologist and he moved to the University of Cambridge and did his earliest work on in vitro maturation, that is maturing the eggs outside the body of the human from slices of ovaries. In 1967, Patrick Steptoe gave his lecture and faced a lot of criticism, just as Subhash Mukherjee faced. And at, this was at the Royal Society of London, where they both connected, where finally he gave his lecture and, and they both met over there and uh, Edwards approached Stepto to collaborate. The first 40 patients, there was no pregnancy in 1976, the first five year pregnancy they had, which was unfortunately an ectopic pregnancy, which was not within the uterus, but in the fallopian tube. And this was through a single blastocyst transfer after a total of 102 attempts at pregnancy. In 1976, Mrs. Leslie Brown saw Stepto when she heard about his work and then she was finally pregnant and the baby of the century, Louis Brown, was born on the 25th of July, 1978. In 78, after the baby was born, both of them got a standing ovation at the Royal College of OBGYN at the, and the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And we all forget that in 1979, Alistair, the world's first IVF boy, has been born. The Nobel Prize in 2010 was awarded to Bob Edwards and Patrick Steptoe. Unfortunately, both of them are not with us today. Such a marked difference between what Subhash Mukherjee faced and what Patrick and Edward faced. So now the story of IVF continues today. Life is much easier for us. Over the last 40 years, more than 4 million babies have been born worldwide. And things have been completely simplified. Earlier days, we could hardly, you know, get anything. It was all creating everything in your own lab, including the pipettes and the distilled water, etc. Everything had to be done within the lab. But today, it's become much easier. Cycles can be monitored with ultrasound. Hormone assays have come into the field. This is, you know, this has been a collaborative project, sort of, between the clinicians, the scientists, the, the industry, the Everyone has pitched in to give us the day we are facing today. Ovulation induction, besides tablets, we got the gonadotrophins, then the protocols came in, the agonists, the antagonists to give you better success rates. Ult uh, egg retrieval was done through ultrasound transvaginally rather than through a laparoscopy, which a woman had to undergo every single time she had an egg picked. Embryo transfer was earlier done, uh, you know, just manually without any guidance. But when they started doing it under ultrasound guidance, it was known that it gives you much better results. Unfortunately, everyone who had embryos put all the embryos in, and then you had news making people who talked on headlines, uh, women born with, uh, with triplets, women born with quadruplets, children born with, you know, six children at a time. And this used to be considered as a success, which unfortunately today we don't. We think it's a complication of IVF because of all the complications associated with it. And hence came the need that we need to start freezing and freezing the embryos so that they could be used later rather than throw them away. So freezing got developed, which came in first as a slow freezing and then got modified. The slow freezing didn't give great results. Then came the vitrification or rapid freezing, which gave very good results. 
and because of which sperms, embryos, everything got frozen. But eggs were again an issue because eggs, in, in, I think it was in Rome that it was not allowed to freeze eggs and therefore, I mean freeze embryos and therefore they came up with the idea of freezing eggs. And that's how eggs started getting frozen. Eggs got frozen, embryos, sperms, everything. So there was a little bit of liberty to people on how they wanted to do their eggs. Men didn't have to be so stressed. We so often find that men can't produce a sperm on the day we want them to because when the eggs are retrieved, they're not able to produce the sperms and therefore embryo sperm freezing became very, very important for such patients. So when we had embryo and egg donation uh, started because we could freeze embryos, we could freeze eggs and we could freeze sperm. So everything could be frozen, tested and then even donated later. With women who did not have healthy uteri, uh, then came the scene that when you want to put the embryo back, if the embryo, if the endometrium or if the uterus doesn't accept that embryo and just keeps rejecting, then what do you do? And therefore, the thought came of hiring a woman or talking about surrogacy, where you put the embryo into another woman's uterus, let the embryo grow. Once the baby is born, that baby becomes the child of the biological parents who have donated, who have allowed their embryos to put inside that surrogate. But then when surrogacy became very, very successful, reproductive tourism started because there were countries where surrogacy was banned. There were countries, there were many single men who wanted babies and they were not allowed to have babies. So in short, a lot of reproductive tourism happened. Um, air travel was flourishing, hotels in India were flourishing and many came to India because we all speak English, we had great results and therefore surrogacy uh, really went up. I mean, reproductive tourism uh, got very, very, very popular. Then came the pre-implantation genetic screening and diagnosis where, wherein we could identify which are the good embryos to put inside the uterus, or if there was a disease which a particular family had, like say, for example, thalassemia, both the couple, pair, partners in a couple having thalassemia minor. If they would like to know whether their child is thalassemia major or not, this was a great way to determine whether the embryo is affected or not, and then whether to transfer it or not into the uterus. The agenda was to diagnose any abnormality, but then it was also used sometimes for screening to identify which are the good embryos so that you get great results. There were women who were having no eggs in their ovaries. They, they were born with primary amenorrhea or were in failure. There were women who have been busy with their careers and have not been able to have babies in a younger age. Or there are women who undergo premature menopause. They had a problem having eggs in their ovaries and therefore would not be able to get pregnant. So in such women came the ovarian transplant where one of our own doctors from India, from Bombay especially, Dr. Praveen Matri made the first ovarian transplant in the world. And he is uh, the one who started it. But later on, uh, ovarian transplants went on brilliantly, but at the same time, when IVF became popular, eggs could be frozen, eggs could be donated. Then more of egg donation happened rather than ovarian transplants. And today we see that women who don't have healthy uterus or those who, who are not eligible for surrogacy, we can even do uterine transplants from them and children have been born with it, with a uterine transplant. So there have been seven ways fertility treatment has changed or will change in the near future. If you look at pre-implantation genetic testing, you get better pregnancy rate, there is reduced miscarriages, and it prevents transfer of abnormal embryos into the womb. Sequencing of the human genome, which was done, completed in April 2003, has been, we have been having the ability to genetic analysis e very economically and accurately now. And this is expanding rapidly with the technology of sequencing human genome. And today the molecular genetics has gone so far ahead that we are able to do many more things. Like if you talk about sequencing of the human genome, 10 years ago it cost $500 million. And in another 20 years it would probably cost only a few hundred rupees in 27 uh, 2017, it cost $1,000 or approximately 65,000 rupees. So in short, human genome, a sequencing of it has helped tremendously in the field of IVF. So we are able to do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, by which we mean we take a small 
tissue or biopsy of a small cell from an embryo and look for a particular abnormal gene in it so that if that embryo has that gene, then you don't transfer it and you avoid an abnormal child being formed. But at the same time, now you have the non-invasive PGD, which is coming up where you don't biopsy the embryo, but you take the culture media where the embryo has grown and then try and determine whether it is normal or not normal. Fertility treatment, the second thing which will happen is we use a lot of hormones for our patients when we are stimulating them for uh, retrieving many more eggs. But now with the advent of uh, in vitro maturation of eggs, wherein you can mature immature eggs outside the body, these will help to reduce the number of gonadotrophins or the amount of gonadotrophins we give to a woman and thus receive, reduce the side effects and morbidity of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And so today, more and more women are freezing their eggs. And they're freezing their eggs at a younger age because many of them are at this point in time, very involved in their careers. They are not ready to have a baby at, uh, at the age between 20 to 30. Most of them come to us at 32, 33. And then we may find that their, polyc that their uh, ovarian reserve is limited and it's reduced. And then they get very apprehensive. Some of them are not married. Some of them are still single. Some of them are still not dating. So they don't know when they get married. And therefore, it gives them the opportunity to freeze their eggs at a younger age so that they have a higher chance of getting pregnant later on when they wish to by having eggs which are younger, though they may be older in age biologically as women. Then came the three parent babies, which has recently been approved by the UK government. And this is basically to prevent any embryo to be formed, which has got any of the disorders, which is due to the egg. And therefore in that, the, uh, the cytoplasm or part of the cell of the uh, mother's egg is is uh, changed and the cytoplasm of a younger woman is put in. So the advantage is that 97% of the genetic material, which is in the DNA of the woman, is carried on into the next uh, next generation, which otherwise, if you use an egg donor, uh, that uh, genetic material is not passed on by the mother at all to the baby. So the future holds a lot of uh, you know, good things. One is, of course, that uterine transplants have started and surrogacy will give way to uterine transplants, which will hopefully become very successful. The first baby has already been born, and uh, that was in 2019. The next agenda is where stem cells could be used. There are women with hardly any eggs in their ovaries. Probably they're born without them, or they have uh, you know, prematurely reached menopause, or at the age of 40, 42, they have hardly any eggs left when they want to get pregnant. So in such cases, when women run, may run out of eggs, and men actually don't run out of sperms even till the age of 70. But, uh, but the thing is that if they also have a problem with their sperms, then there is a possibility that you could produce stem cells from, I mean, you could use stem cells to produce gametes or to produce eggs and sperms. Of course, it's still not in the clinical practice with more research. And even a cell from the skin can be used to create eggs and sperms. So embryos have been created in the animal kingdom and they have you uh, sort of utilized them, but unfortunately uh, we are still far away from using it in human beings. The next big blockbuster is the artificial intelligence, which is being used on a day-to-day -day, uh, way in, you, in day practice, like everyone calling an Uber is using artificial intelligence. In short, in applications in healthcare, healthcare it's already being used in radiology, cardiology and oncology. But now the application is coming in into assisted reproduction in the late 90s. It came in and it helps us to select eggs and embryos, which are the best to be transferred. There's an immense ongoing research on the embryo and the endometrium. And artificial intelligence will assist us in selecting the best embryo and the best time to transfer this embryo. And hopefully, we, once all this comes in, even today with whatever we have, we have been able to increase our pregnancy rates from a, from a very small percentage, which was 40, 50 years ago, to about 50% per cycle today. But we are still not able to offer 100% success to our couples who keep anxiously waiting cycle after cycle, hoping to get pregnant. And there are many ethic, ethical challenges with artificial insemination. There are so many issues. Say, for example, if artificial intel, uh, intelligence identifies an 
abnormal embryo as a normal embryo and that is transferred who will be blamed who are you going to blame for that abnormal embryo to be put inside could this technology be misused for designing embryos with the best genes are we all going to get superhuman beings in this world so in short probably in our country people may use it misuse it for sex determination so there are so many ethical and legal issues which exist and therefore today we have to think of our future generation because 100 years later the future will be our grandchildren's not mine not yours and therefore we need to think before we subject ourselves to any issues which could be a problem for our future generation so we all need to shape a world where instead of banning research which happens unfortunately in our country sometimes and banning research and new technology we should embrace them for maximum benefit with as little harm as humanly possible so i thank you all for your kind attention and i'll be uh, i'm really delighted uh, to be here with all of you and share this memorial day which i really really thoroughly enjoyed and i was very happy to meet kanupriya whom i also met when i stepped down as the sar president on the stage when calcutta when i was uh, completing my presidency so thank you very much all of you thank you so much uh, dr shah for taking us to the 42 years of ivf in india and a sneak peek into the future we could almost see the uh, science and art of art unfolding in front of us thank you so much uh, this is a day to remember and nothing more can be memorable than an event like this it is my immense pleasure to thank each one of you to be present here thank you our guest dr uh, durusha Uh, Professor Sadanda and uh, Kanupriya for being here, and your presence has made this evening an event extraordinary. Uh, thank you, Shabani and Rajvi, for organizing this event, and thank you, Dr. Malay and Dr. Matilkar, for encouraging us and pushing us to taking to this activity. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank our backend team, Mr. Rambarai and uh, Mr. Sushant uh, of ICMR and IRRH for all the management and the the, the ease at which this event took place and uh, coordinating with everyone is a tough task, as you all know, and they have done it extremely well. Thank you, Ram. Thank you, Sushant, and uh, we thank ICMR and SAF for patronizing the achievements of Dr. Mukherjee. May his glory shine for years to come. Uh, signing off from here, uh, I Deepak Modi thank each one of you for being a part of the event. Uh, the book launched today and the recording of this event will be available online for public use. Uh, please use it and publicize widely. Uh, thank you once again, and uh, request everyone to switch on the video so that we can have a very quick uh, snapshot. Ram will do the needful. Ram, please uh, take a picture and let us know when you are ready. Uh, everyone, please switch on the video. So that we Happy to. Thank you, Deepak, very much for comparing, and thank all the participants and the speakers for making this day today. And I would like to thank Sri Kaikar, who was the INSA project, who helped a lot uh, while collecting all the material from uh, Dr. Shubhash Mukherjee Memorial Center and compiling. She is also here, so. Please, I request everybody to switch on the video so we can take a snapshot. And I hope next year we can do this event live and we can meet. Or oh, it will be really fun to get together. Ram, please let us know when you get time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful and great weekend. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shabani. Thank you, Dr. Mahali. Thank you, Pak, uh, and uh, it's good to be here.
thank you everybody for making this evening wonderful and all the talk was very informative we came to know so many of uh, his uh, unknown work and about him about his family today and uh, we hope to keep this day alive a uh, meeting every year on this 16 january uh, every year and to uh, give our tribute to him so thank you everybody for joining so bye 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 bye